All right, welcome to the podcast. On today's show, we're talking to Miguel from Somos. Thanks for joining. For people who don't know, what does your company do? Hi, Diego. Thanks a lot for having me. So my name is Miguel Leal. I'm one of the co-founders of Soma Foods, and we make healthy and convenient Mexican food. We want to make Mexican food as approachable and fast as healthy as possible. And before we get into your company, we've been trying to use this. I said this off air to you. We've been trying to use this product, Riverside, for a long time. And I think they finally figured out a way to make this podcasting so easy for us. And so here we are using Riverside and the uh, quality looks good. I wanted to start with your journey around, uh, specifically around when you were at Kind. And so what did you learn? What did you see in the marketplace working under Daniel? And what was your impetus for wanting to, to launch this brand? What did you see that was missing? Yeah, you know, it's so funny that you ask it that way. I don't think I've ever been asked that question before, but Kind was so important for the story of Somos. I would say just learning from kind was the role that a business should take in society. What is the responsibility of leaving the communities that you operate better than you found them? And that's something it's at the very center of Somos. Somos means we are. So it's about two cultures coming together. I think working with Daniel was also very important for me because you know, Kind is so successful and Daniel is probably, you know, one of the most successful, if not the most successful founder in food. And I think what set him apart is that Kind was not a three-year venture. It took 24, 25 years to build Kind to where it is today. And he always, you know, bet on the long term. He never took any shortcuts. He with culture, with the product, with the relationships, with the retail. And that was something that was very impactful for me, you know, second MBA for me working working for him. But more importantly, that's where the idea of Somos came from. You know, we were looking to what would we do next? And we were pitching ideas to each other. And one day late at night in the middle of the summer, that's when the idea of Somos came about. I really love that. I mean, I think for... I mean, you could talk about this in some way, but usually when you when you watch an entrepreneur of that caliber that figures it out, it's like a couple things stick out. It's like the philosophy they have, and then it goes back to like the traction they're trying to achieve. And you know, when you take shortcuts, you get cut short. It's an interesting thing to think about. But I think a lot of entrepreneurs, specifically young entrepreneurs, think, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna become a hundred millionaire in three years. And um, while certainly that can happen, it's very rare. More more often is the chance that someone dedicates seven to ten years, if not more, of their life to finding that success. Yeah, and I've been doing this for a while, Diego, and I think something that we try to do is we romanticize the early successes or the, and we discount the people that have put in the work and have been doing it for a while. We just, you know, I think it's a matter of attention. You know, it's, it's much easier to talk, like you said, about the two, three year successes and putting in the time. But, you know, what we do in food in particular, it just takes a while. You know, the channels, they take a while to feel you're, you know, doubling or triple in sales every year. And that has a lot of uh, challenges with sourcing and with manufacturing and just adoption, you know, for people to try it and repeat the purchase and then to share that and recommend it to other people. I think most of the time it looks like this. That's true. So what, when you first came to market, what were the first products you, you came to market with? Yeah, it's interesting. We wanted to make sure there was a product market fit. So we launched chips and salsas in uh, September, uh, I want to say three years ago, September of 2021. And, you know, we had a lot of success. We had a lot of people buy them. I think we estimated sales to be X and it ended up being 5X. We were still, you know, a little bit at the end of COVID. So people were buying a lot of things direct to consumer. And and I also feel like maybe, you know, we, we have just big families, the three of us, the three co-founders. So we had a, a, a false read on the market and really push to do these boxes of D2C. And then coming in January, we were all outside, you know, we were not in COVID, we, you know, retail to cover again. And then, and then we realized that 
you know, maybe sending boxes of Mexican food that would last for a month was not the variety that, that people were looking for before the pandemic ended, right? Yeah, that's so funny. And did you get funding before you launched or how did you guys self-fund this? What was that like? Yeah, so the, the three of us self-funded it. We've been, you know, very scrappy when it comes on, on what we are doing and how we are building this. Uh, it's our money that we're putting together, the three of us. Prorata. And, you know, when I thought about starting the business, there weren't a lot of Mexicans doing CPG, you know, when I started my career. And two of my favorite people were Rodrigo and Daniel. And we started off as friends and we would just connect and share stories and help each other out. And then we started working together at kind. So it just made sense that we would do it together. And, and as an added bonus, Kind of like at the same time that we were doing Somos or putting the business plan in Somos, Daniel was starting Camino Partners, which, you know, really does this. You know, they invest in brands for the long term and leveraging Daniel's team and expertise and capital for sure. So it was, you know, not only doing businesses with friends that I really enjoy, but then also all the infrastructure, we were very lucky that that came as a result of that. I want to ask you a question. So for the listeners who might be thinking about starting their own CPG brand or their own company, you know, what kind of time horizon are you are you thinking about as you obviously given your experience under with, with Kind, but then today, just to give people a window into look, here's here's the game, you know, here's really and you might not succeed, but here at least is what you need to prepare for. What would you tell those people? Yeah, so I am in my late 40s. And I just where I am in, in my career and in life, you know, I really wanted to do something different, which was this startup. And I wanted to do it for the next 10 years. So we made a commitment to each other and we said, hey, we're going to give this a go. We need to be, you know, really very true to each other, very making sure that if things are not working out, we say it. But if we hit certain struggles, and we have, you know, through the couple of years that we've been on market, that we see this as a 10-year project. You know, it, it took kind 15 years to really get going, and we thought, maybe naively so, that we could leverage some of the experience from kind and maybe do it in five years less than kind to have this, you know, crushing it then. And now, actually, I think the opposite. Now that we've been doing it for a while, it takes more time and it takes more money to do it right. But we are at the point that the team is in much better shape this year than it was the year before. Our performance is doing better with relationships with the trade is doing better. Our cash flow profit you know, looks a lot better than it last year. Why would I exit now? Like now we have a really successful business. I don't lose any sleep at night thinking, hey, what, what if Somos doesn't make it anymore? So now I might have been pushing, you know, my my time in the company actually farther out than I did it before I started. In some way, you guys are seasoned. So the second time you go around this, did you ever think about maybe you acquire some companies to get to get early growth or just or even now? Maybe are you thinking about the stage where you, you can sort of acquire one plus one equals three? Any anything, any rumblings? Yeah, no, I mean, we, we've we looked at, at both of them, but we always, you know, reach the same decision. You know, we really want Somos to outlive us. One day we will not be here and, and Somos will still be there on the shelves. And the more that we work on it, the more we realize the potential. Like we think there is a 30 billion addressable market that in the next five, 10 years, more consumers are going to cook Mexican food at home, just like they do with Italian food. And and the more that we do it, the more we realize there is nothing more important that we could be doing than this. And it goes back to the shortcut. Like at the beginning of our journey, we could have merged with another company and get us to profitability faster and, you know, things like that. But every time that that comes up, we always have the same thing. And it is... You know, Somos is going to be one of the most beautiful things that we do professionally, and it should have all of our attention. 
I really love that. One of the projects we're working on here, I do real estate development. One of the things we're doing is creating a market called Juntos. And it's uh, the idea of a, Los Angeles is, has a lot of Asian influence and a lot of uh, Latin American influences. And so I, we're partnering up with a Taiwanese chef. And so he draws a lot of inspiration from the Asian cultures. I'm from Peru. And so naturally, there's a lot of Latin American cultures. And in, and in LA, there's both. And so we're, we're starting this project that it's a way to sort of introduce the blending of the food, you know, we're calling it Juntos Market. And of course, we'll have products uh, that we'll sell in the market. But it, it's really just like a time. And I think obviously, I can speak to it in LA, but it's also a time I think in, in America in general, where to your point, I mean, uh, the addressable market of introducing Latin foods, Mexican products is massive. And there's a massive opportunity there. It seems like that's what you're that's what you're aligning to, which makes a lot of sense. I love it, Diego. And I love the name. Like I never thought of Juntos when we were coming up with Somos, but all those, you know, community driven words. And I, I love Juntos so much because it has the hard J on it. Yeah. 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 We should at some <laughs> point collaborate Juntos and Somos. We can, we can do something for sure. It's going to be a, a little, a part of the building is also going to be for media. And so the idea there is chef is kind of a known person. And so the idea, you know, is like, here we are making this dish, da, 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 da. And then we, we sell tickets and people can learn in real time how to cook some of these products. But early days, but we'll see. Have you ever, this is kind of a funny question because Daniel's obviously been a guest shark on Shark Tank, but have you ever th thought about going on Shark Tank? I don't. Like I, I feel I feel Shark Tank is great and for the people that participate is fantastic. But I have Daniel and from all the sharks, he would be the one that I would like to have on this business. So yeah. I would rather leave that opportunity <laughs> uh, to someone else, you know? What other products are you guys launching with? I know there's a whole line of the, the plant-based products. I don't think you guys, you phrase it in the right way where I don't think you go vegan, vegan, you know what I mean? But it's a, what, what, what products are you guys working on now to expand the line? Yeah, so, you know, our story, we pivoted a D2C portfolio into retail. So once D2C kind of like didn't give us what we thought it was going to give us. We went to Expo West uh, 22 months ago, a year and change. And, and we saw that there was this huge opportunity to innovate in the Mexican set of the store, to bringing more mainstream consumers into the Mexican set. And we were very lucky because Rice became our hero product. We launch our rices, rices perform really well. And then we follow up with a great innovation, which was the Mexican street corn rice, which is our number one product today. Number one product. Wow. Okay. Yeah. And it's performed tremendously well where it is in distribution. It's a top five, top 10 skew in the, in the rice set. And it was really great for us after the bad read that we had in D2C. To, to have, you know, this line of products that just immediately from the get-go perform with brands that have been in the market 30, 40, and 50 years. And, and right now, you know, we launched last year with Whole Foods our enchilada sauces. And after six months in the market, in many regions of Whole Foods, it's already the number one and the number two skew in that set. So we think, you know, now we have this amazing one-two punch, you know, and we are less about promoting products and less about and more about promoting recipes. So think now that you have, you know, some cooking sauces and then a line of rices of all the different recipes that that unlocks, you know, we, we like to say that we like to market like a Lego set, you know, and now that you have all these new pieces, all the recipes that, that you can build from that. So that's really, you know, we're priority right now. I love that. I mean, it makes so much sense. So basically you start with the recipe first, you start with the thing first, and then you go, not the recipe, but the product first. And then you see how, how many different dishes, I guess you can, you can make from that. And so from a marketing perspective, how much, like, what do you spend most of your time on? Like, what do you attribute the success to? Obviously one part of it is clearly there's demand, but then the other part of it is in educating the consumer or informing the consumer. So how do you guys go about, what, what do you see? It's hard, but what do you see working in that space? Yeah, and that's exactly right. Like, I, I think what we are doing, we are very good at and no one else is doing. You know, like I see a lot of people that, a lot of other companies, startups that are, you know, great at social or that they are, you know, great with influencers. 
you know, with us, what we do, kind of like our secret sauce, is two things. So we start from the way that we look at trends because of the 68 billion addressable market of Mexican food, 82% is in restaurants. So most Mexican food comes from restaurant. Really, only people like me that have a Mexican abuela go and buy groceries. Mexican food is, you know, the food that is presented today on the set requires a lot of ingredients and a lot of time to make tacos. You know, it's, it's not simple. So we look at a lot of data on restaurants. We work with companies that aggregate changes in menus across thousands of restaurants in the U.S. And that's how we found the Mexican street corn. That was a trend that was happening. We were able to bring it into retail and that became our number one skill. So we are, you know, we work a lot of time looking at that. And, you know, we do it ourselves. We buy secondary data. I think there's a lot of richness in those conversations. So for me, that is like the input piece. And then the output you know, the biggest part of our marketing mix is working with retailers, putting brands together so we can create recipes of, you know, five ingredients, 10 minutes, $15. And we would go, you know, with, with a mass merchant and, and, and partner with certain customers, uh, with certain brands there, other manufacturers, and create those recipes. So it's a little bit of category management, and then there is a lot of shopper marketing that has to happen. And a lot of the beauty is when people have the finished product, and they say, I can't believe this only took 10 minutes. I can't believe this food came out of the microwave. That is really the aha moment. There are other people that make Mexican food. There are other people that make pouches but no one is bringing all of it together in, in partnerships at the store like we do. A ton of people do it on social media, but not at the moment of purchase. I mean, that's amazing what you just said there. And so you're aggregating menus to see what the restaurants across the country are trying to bring to the market. Then you're seeing what works. And then always partnering with the retailers, the smart move. I don't think people understand that enough. You can't force them to do anything. I mean, you can try. Probably not a great idea, but at least they have their own signals of the market of where things are heading. They have their own data set. And so those two paired together output some form of like, I think we should try this. And then you guys go ahead and work. That's amazing. I mean, that's I want to tell people that's a bit of a masterclass that you just shared. And I hope people leverage the data, especially now with new tools in AI, where those things become you know, a little bit simpler in terms of aggregating and uh, processing information. That's fascinating. Really yeah. smart. Makes a lot of sense, actually. We share the data with retailers. They share back the point of view on us. And, you know, whether you are successful or not successful, you're never going to buy a thousand. You're always going to end up with better relationships. And and I feel it takes all of us to make this move. You know, the, the mission of Somos is to take out takeout, that less people are getting food from Mexican restaurants and more people are cooking at home, you know, learning more about the ingredients, learning more about the culture. We have to meet them halfway and do simpler recipes. And you are not going to do it by yourselves. It would be impossible for a brand of Somos to take it out. But the opportunity to close that gap is 30 billion of the 70 billion. That's the under index that retailers have. So if you go out and reach out to other brands and then you also work together with retailers, between all of us, we can get it done faster. And it's like the tide that raises all boats, right? That's fascinating. I mean, it's it's, it's exciting just to hear you talk about it because, I mean, the way you're approaching this is uh, it's a lot of chess. It's a, It's beautiful in that way. I mean, it's very methodical, very thoughtful. It speaks to the brand. The Somos name is a beautiful thing where it's like we're all together in this. We are partnering with retailers. That's really cool. What do you think is next? What do you think is next for the company? I mean, obviously, you have success right now with the the corn, the rice. Where do you want to take it? What's the innovation that you see percolating? Yeah, I mean, I, I think we just need to get better. So we are on year two. So when we look at, at our execution, you know, we have... To a couple of retailers where we've just done a really good job with these partnerships. Uh, and they are big. I would say, you know, maybe it's about a thousand stores between both of them that we are executing this the way that we wanted to do. So a lot of it is just, 
you know, establishing relationships, showing the data on how much we are growing the category, how much we are bringing uh, the mainstream consumer into the Mexican set. That is really uh, our objective that we want to do. We want more people to fall in love with Mexican culture through food, okay? And and execute better this partnership. As you know, with chopper marketing, it is not something that you can execute nationally. Every retailer, you know, has their own loyalty card data, or some people really like to do coupons, on some others like to do bogos, and 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 you really have to tailor made. You know, one of our partners in a Midwest chain is not as big you know, in the natural channel. So we have to look to other partners there. So there is still a lot of meat on the bone in terms of activating these partnerships. I would like also to maybe get better and faster on the data side and start seeing a lot of those trends. You know, like you mentioned AI, we we played a lot with, with AI. We actually have a, you know, if you go to abuela.ai, we have a Mexican grandma that teaches you recipes and you can tell her what you have in the fridge and she would come up with a recipe for you. And we would like to start aggregating a lot more of that wow. data and maybe bring some technology to the shelf that we've been playing with for next year. So th- those are really the places where I think we could be doing a much better job. And uh, yeah, I think, you know, like we, from where we started in the podcast, I think this is a 10, 15 year journey. And if we just get a little bit better every quarter at this execution, it it really adds up over time. I love the abuela.ai. I'm going to check that out. So you go on, it's a website. That's so cool. It's actually model after my mom, like my biological mother. So we did a, 360 scan of her for a whole day and it's in it's in the way that she talks so it has a little bit of a mexican item we had her record i don't remember how many thousands of words and yeah yeah you know you you have to be a little bit playful with these things right that's a lot of fun i want to ask you a sort of a high level question so i remember speaking i went to an event one day and uh one of the secretaries that was working with obama specifically tailored to mexican american relations was there and he was giving us a window into you know, how, how many, like how America, how dependent we actually are on Mexico in terms of, just in terms of importing. Here you are, and I don't know, you know, obviously between the three of you, you have your success. Is this an initiative? Can it be an initiative for the country? Because it's a lot bigger than that, right? It's relationships. It's our closest neighbor. It's import. Is there a broader discussion here that Somos is thinking about and just in terms of American-Mexican relationships? Yeah, I mean, we started the company where there was a lot of heat on immigration. And I don't think, you know, that has completely gone away. But I re- I don't remember the exact number, but I remember just Daniel, Rodrigo and I talking about how much more Mexican food was more popular than Mexicans or Mexican culture. So here you have the number one ethnic food in the country. You know, during COVID, Mexican food surpassed Italian food to become the number one ethnic food. Yet, you know, there was all this, you know, pushback. And, you know, we are, the three of us, you know, very, you know, I came to this country to study. You know, this country gave me a scholarship, gave me opportunities, gave me education. I met my wife, who's American. I became a U.S. citizen 12 years ago. Like I I am in a lot of ways very much in debt to this country. But, you know, I do feel that there is a lot of room to become better in that relationship. And we it's not going to be done with Somos. It's very much like what we're trying to do. It's going to take like a, a lot of people to do it. But I do want Somos Going back to the question you asked me at the beginning, what did I learn from Kind? I would like Somos to to play a small role in that. 70, 80% of all the dollars that come to Somos are spent either with Mexican or Latin communities, either in Mexico or in the US. And it's this just like beautiful cycle of, you know, Mexican chefs producing this great food. So people in this country 
can enjoy it and can save money and can learn more about Mexico. And then some of those dollars go back and get invested in that community. And, and that's really back to the ethos of Somos on the reason we started the company. I, I think that is, you know, if, if we can execute that, then it was worth our time to do this. I want to ask you this question because we've had uh, we've had Hector from Tia Lupita on the podcast after his Shark Tank debut. You mm-hmm. guys are ex- expanding the market together in some way, playing nice in the sandbox. Uh, you ever think about making an acquisition there? I mean, it seems <laughs> <laughs> with, with Hector, I've asked him many times. He doesn't want to sell. No, Hector. <laughs> Hector is both one of my closest friends. I mean, we grew up together. I was his son, little league coach for three or four years. So we worked together at Diamond Foods, like we, the two of us are from Monterrey. He's both, you know, one of my closest friends, but also an inspiration. I saw what he did, you know, with the company, he became an entrepreneur three or four years before I did. When he did his rounds of friends and family, my wife and I, you know, invested with him because we believe on on what he was doing. So no, you know, very much. Um, well, I think we actually... The way that we are doing, advancing this together, and it's and it's not only Hector. You know, we are now organizing dinners with Latin founders. We had sixty of them in the first dinner we organized in New York. We're doing another one in March in LA, and I think there is a lot of room to do more, to be more supportive of each other through the whole ecosystem. Not not only the brand owners, but you know, mentors and, and investment like Daniel and Camino Partners and, you know, bankers and suppliers and the whole supply chain, you know, we, we should be, you know, I think working more closely together. Add me to that list. I do some angel investing myself. That'd be great to be there. Where can people find you? Where can people shop, buy the product, tell everyone where they can, they can yeah. enjoy the deliciousness? Yeah, so I'm I'm always worried about this question because I don't like leaving anybody outside. But you know, Meyer, H E B, Sprout, Whole Foods, Albertsons, Safeway, Target, Walmart, and Publix next month. And yeah, and hope to continue to grow that list with uh, Expo West coming up the second week of March. So if you're, if you're in LA and uh, if, you could, if you can come and see us, we'll be having some, serving some amazing tacos at the show. Miguel, thank you for coming on the podcast and sharing the story. Really inspiring. And I hope our listeners take a lot of key. I mean, you, you dropped a lot of good bombs here, a lot of good pro tips. And I think, I hope the next CPG founder is sort of starts on second base or third base based on what you've shared today. Thank you, brother. Thank you, Diego, for having me and for your support of Somos. Thank you for tuning in. If you enjoyed this episode, share with your friends, your family, or anyone you might think might benefit from the conversation we've had today. And if you haven't already, please take a moment to leave a review on your favorite podcast platform. We'd greatly appreciate it. Your feedback helps us improve and reach more people who can benefit from our discussions. The best way to stay connected with us and get the latest updates on future episodes is through our social media channels. You can find us at Startup Storefront. We'll be back next Tuesday with another great episode. See you then.